Okay, let's get our Bibles open to Luke chapter 24. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. We've been going through the book of Luke, and we know that, of course, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, but we also know that he wrote the book of Acts. Yeah. And it's likely that he knew he was going to write the book of Acts once he began writing the book of Luke. And uh, it's really interesting. He ends off the Gospel with one of his favorite literary devices, and that's called compression. Well, what are we talking about? Go to Acts chapter 1. Come on, bro. All right. Acts chapter 1, and in verse 1, it says in my former book, of course, that's Luke referring to his gospel, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. You know, when Jesus resurrected from the dead, he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Yeah. How about it? Are there convincing proofs in your life that Jesus is alive? Yeah. Can people see the resurrected Christ in your day-to-day -day life? On, and it says he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So we know Jesus began his ministry when he was 30 years old. He ministered for three years. He died and was resurrected on the third day. Now, after he resurrected, he appeared to the apostles for a period of 40 days. Now we go to Luke chapter 24, and it's incredible because we're going to see that 40-day period compressed into one single day. So everything that happened, essentially, of course, there are things that Luke had to leave out, but we get the morning, the afternoon, and the evening of one day. Now go to Luke chapter 1. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Luke 1. Come on, bro. Come on, Gabe. When he begins his gospel, we remember that John the Baptist's birth was prophesied and told to his father and mother by the angel. And what happened? Zechariah didn't believe the angel. So then he was made mute for the whole term of the pregnancy. He couldn't speak for nine months because he lacked faith. But when John the Baptist is born, Zechariah then gives us this benediction. He sings this song. And if you pick it up in verse 76, it says, you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. You know, it's incredible in the Greek, it says that the rising sun will shine on those seated in darkness. Wow. Seated denoting the idea that you can't even get up and walk. Wow. You can't change your life even if you wanted to. And it talks about Jesus, the son of man, being the rising sun that will come to us from heaven yeah, on, to give us hope and salvation. On, and you know, of course, the rising sun means the dawn of a new day. That's the title of the lesson, the dawn of a new day. On, All right, let's go to Luke chapter 24. All right, come on. And what we'll see here, three simple points. The morning of wonder, the afternoon of burning hearts, and the evening of hope. Luke chapter 24, verse 1. It says here, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they didn't believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, However, got up and ran to the tomb, bending over. He saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. 
the morning of wonder. You know, the women, they go to continue to prepare the body of Jesus for burial. They show up, the tomb is opened, and Jesus, the Lord, is not in the tomb. Wow. You know, it's incredible, because as disciples, we believe that Jesus physically resurrected from the dead. Amen. It wasn't like metaphysically. It wasn't his ghost. His body was dead, dead, dead. Three days dead. He wasn't in a coma. It wasn't some sort of medical phenomena. He was totally flatlined, dead. Yes. And then his body was made alive again. Amen. And they go and they find that the tomb is empty and they wonder what could have happened. They just, what does this mean? And then Peter gets up, dashes to the tomb, finds it empty with only the linens left behind. You know, it's incredible because even Jesus made his bed when he resurrected from the dead. Amen. Amen. That was a point for the single brothers. And Peter walks away. He himself wondering what had happened. You know, they were perplexed. They were surprised. They were confused. But you got to believe that there was an ember of hope in their hearts. And they think, well, may, maybe, just maybe, he's resurrected. You know, I believe that if you're visiting with us this morning, there's an ember of hope in your heart. You say, maybe, just maybe, I found the church that God has led me to, come on, come on, come on. that preaches the word, that stands for the truth, that doesn't care what the world says or does, that's not politically motivated or racially motivated, but motivated by the word of God. And you say there were two angels. Well, why two angels? Why not just one angel? One angel, after all, in the Old Testament, waylaid 185,000 Assyrian soldiers, killed them in one foul swoop. Well, what can two angels do? Well, you know, for the Jew, two people, two witnesses established a truth. So you have two angels establishing the truth that Jesus is resurrected. And they say kind of, I think, tongue in cheek to the women. They say, why do you look for the living among the dead? You know, you can't find what is alive among the dead. Turn your Bible, hold your finger there and go to Hebrews chapter six. Hebrews chapter six. We've got to make the Bible relevant to us because it is. So if we go to church and we hear some nice platitudes and walk away and say, wow, I really needed that word, but don't change. That's not the Bible's fault. That's your preacher's fault. Amen. Amen. It says in verse one, therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ, Hebrews chapter six, and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and to faith in God, instructions about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, God permitting, we will do so. You know, right here it talks about the elementary teachings or the first principles of the faith, which we've been doing as a church, not only learning the fundamental truths about Christianity, but also how to teach the fundamental truths about Christianity. Are you with me? It's not enough to know you need to be a disciple and disciples make disciples that make disciples. There's a great preacher. The brother who leads our church in London says you haven't made a disciple until your disciple has made a disciple. Oh. And it says here, acts that lead to death. Now, what do you assume are the acts that lead to death? What, what's the first thing that kind of comes into mind? What do you think? A little bit of crowd participation. Why not? Sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, right? What else? We got one. Murder. Chris. Pride. Pride. Melissa, do you have your hand up? Yeah. Faithlessness. Faithlessness. Addiction. These are things that lead to spiritual death or even physical death. It's very interesting because in the Greek, what's translated as acts that lead to death is actually useless rituals. So this is not a reference to like overt, obvious sin, but actually the whole book of Hebrews was written to contrast the power and the life and the activity of Christianity to the deadness of the Jewish religion. Wow. It says, what makes it dead? The useless rituals that lack the power to change your life. Come on, man. Come on. Now that happens today. You go to church and you've been going to church your whole life. Or you've been spiritual your whole life, yet you lack the power to change. Come on, man. You say, well, maybe I'll just go to the church down the street. 
But the useless rituals will lead to your spiritual inevitable death. You see, in God's kingdom, we believe in giving many convincing proofs that Jesus is alive and well in our midst. Amen? Amen. You know what? One thing that can lead to our spiritual death is sentimentality. You know, Satan is not sentimental. He doesn't think that your relatives are saved just because they're your relatives. Jesus is not sentimental. When you've shed your blood for something, are you sentimental about it? No. All you want to know and deal with is the truth. We're not determined. Our salvation is not determined by how we feel or what we believe, but rather what the Bible teaches. Go to John chapter 8. John 8, verse 31 to 32. I'm sorry if you're sitting next to the speakers there. I'm sure it's gotten a little loud by now. It says to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You know, the Bible says for you to be set free from your sin, you need to be a disciple and know the truth. To be a disciple, you need to obey Jesus's teachings. He says this to a group of people that had believed in him. And he says, if, which makes it a conditional statement. If you believe, then you will obey. There you go. But if you don't obey, then your belief doesn't matter. That's right. You know, there's a false doctrine in the religious world that says faith alone will save you. The only place in the Bible where that phrase faith alone shows up is in James chapter 2. Let's go there. Yes. Come on, bro. Come on. James chapter 2. Come on, Jerry. Come on. Come on, Jerry. Wow. Listen, bro. James 2, it says in verse 14, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good, even the demons believe that and shudder. Belief alone doesn't save you. Even the demons believe. Verse 20, you foolish man. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? You see, there it is. Useless rituals or acts that lead to death. Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. The only time that phrase faith alone shows up in the Bible right before it, it says you are not saved by faith alone. You are not justified by faith alone. You are justified when you have faith and when your actions match your faith. Belief is not enough. It's never been enough. It will never be enough. Of course, we believe if you have true faith, then you will obey. Amen. But some of these passages are hard to obey. The Bible says, do everything without complaining or arguing. The Bible says, rejoice always. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. The Bible says to be bold and to preach the word wherever you go. How about it? There's some hard things to obey. Oh, yeah. But you got to do it. Even if you do it badly, you still got to obey. We're like children, you know. You know when you tell your children, it actually takes a lot more energy to train a child than to just correct a child or control a child. You say, you got to train them. You say, Daddy, you know, your kids say, Daddy, I want to help you to clean or I want to help you to cook. And you're like, oh, no. No, you know, that's just going to make it doubly hard. And when we decide to become disciples, God's like, okay, all right, here we go. 
We got to train this child in the way that he or she should go. Yes. And you might do it messy and it might cause the rest of us a little bit of extra cleanup and a little bit of, uh, of supervision over you to make sure that you don't blow it while you're trying to grow. Amen. Yeah. But that's who we are. We're all about making disciples that make disciples. Disciple equals Christian equals saved. If you're not a disciple, according to Jesus's definition, biblically, you're not a Christian. You're not saved. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Jesus never used the word Christian. It only shows up three times in the Bible. The word disciple shows up almost 300 times in the Bible. And the word Christian was used as a nickname given to the disciples. So you don't find two different groups in the Bible like disciples and Christians and the disciples were the uber committed like the old ladies at church. You know, when you go to church and like the older ladies are always the one that are like, you know, really committed Amen. right there. Amen. Right. Amen. Am I wrong? <laughs> You say, well, what about the young men? Come on. Are they just as committed? That's right. yeah. Come on, bro. Are they just as fired up? Come on, bro. Are they just as sold out? Come on, bro. You see, this isn't a religion that's dead. This is on, a religion that is alive. That's right, bro. And the Bible calls us to obey every word. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 28, it says you need to be taught to obey. Yeah. That's right. You need to be, you need help. Yeah. And before you became a disciple, don't kid yourself. That church that you used to go to wasn't making disciples. Come on, bro. That's true. You know, when I teach somebody the, the study discipleship, I say, hey, have you ever heard this before? They say, no. Well, I said, that means two things. You tell me which one it is. The people that you used to go to church with, whether they're your family, friends, or whatever, either didn't want you to know and didn't like you, so they didn't tell you. Or they themselves didn't know. I think it's probably the latter. I, I, I think they probably didn't tell you because they themselves didn't know. You see, you need to be made into a disciple. Can I get an amen? amen. These two angels in Luke 24, go back there. They, they, they solidify the truth that Jesus is resurrected. And then it's interesting because, you know, in verse 6, he says, he, he's not here. He's, he's risen. Remember how he told you while he was with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. You know, sometimes we get spiritual amnesia. Yep. That's why we need a lot of preaching, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's, right. that's why we get together so often. You know, as disciples, we're at church on Sunday morning. Amen. Most of us even go to leaders meeting at 3 p.m. Amen. Oh, we'll even sacrifice the football game oh. to be at leaders meeting. <laughs> you know, we go to church. We've got men's midweek, which is coming up this Wednesday. Yeah. And then we've got women's midweek the following Wednesday. And that's good. If you have kids, you know, then, you know, you can get some child care and everything like that. Like a husband and a wife at men's midweek, the wife stays back at women's midweek, the husband stays back. That's good. Every other Wednesday. Fair enough. Oh, then we have these things called Bible talks. Oh, yeah. right. We get together and we go out and we, we bring our friends and our family to hear the word of God. Yeah, there you go. We fellowship, we eat, we enjoy yeah. each other's company. Then the campus ministry, we've got Friday night devotionals. Yeah! And you know what? Outside of that, we're together all the time, aren't we? Yeah. You'll see. We'll sing the last song here in a bit and nobody will leave. <laughs> we'll brew another pot of coffee. Why? Because, because we know we need it. Yeah. If we don't get a lot of preaching, we start to forget. Yeah. We get spiritual amnesia. Amen. You know, you're wondering about your life and you're perplexed, surprised, and confused. Oh. <laughs> You've got spiritual amnesia. It's a condition that comes upon us when we're seized with fear. Oh. Something in your life is making you afraid. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And you literally forget all the scriptures you've read, memorized, and have heard preached hundreds of times to you before. And you're paralyzed in your faith. You cannot move. Seated in darkness. You know, this is what has happened to our former fellowship. Yeah. There's spiritual amnesia. Amen. And they've forgotten the scriptures. But that's why we preach. That's why we gather so often. So that we can remember. And when we remember, like the women here, there is hope. Amen. 
Amen. We're brought back to our senses. You know, verse 9, it says, They came back from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. Well, who were all the others and where were they? They went back to the upper room where the eleven faithful apostles, because Judas died, were together with the 120. Well, who were the 120? The 12 apostles, the other 70 apostles, the family of Jesus who had become faithful disciples yeah. because he did not compromise when there was persecution. Yeah. Yeah. He stayed faithful. You know, Mark 3, they came and tried to take control of his life because they thought he was out of his mind because he was so committed, he didn't even have time to eat. Yeah. But instead of going with his parents and his family who were trying to control him for selfish reasons, he says, listen, my family is not my physical family. My family is my spiritual family. Yeah. As a matter of fact, God thought up the spiritual family before he thought up the physical family. That's right. He gave you the physical family only to teach you how to behave in the spiritual family. Right. You gotta be loyal, you gotta be committed, you gotta be sold out to the kingdom of God. Yeah. This is a tribal society that Jesus lived in. If his family comes in and tries to take control of him, it's not like today where you say, no, no. I mean, your father exercising paterfamilia, which means he can actually execute you and be within his legal rights to do so. Wow. You don't obey mommy and daddy 2000 years ago. You got a serious issue. Yeah. It's not just cut you off financially so you don't get the newest iPad. You got to deal with life. Wow. And Jesus says here, I'm drawing a line. My father is in heaven. Yeah. Now, you know, because he never compromised, his family saw that this is serious. Yeah. Right. He, could, he wouldn't budge. He didn't compromise. There was, no, there was no open door for them to go through because they saw how serious he was about his salvation. And the reason why he didn't compromise is because he was serious about their salvation. They, too, became faithful disciples. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. James, his brother, becomes the, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Really, in many respects, the leader of the movement in the first century, mm -hmm. making binding decisions for the whole church. His other brother, Jude, wrote the book of Jude. I mean, this is incredible. Because he didn't back down, he stays saved, and everybody around him got saved as well. Yeah. You see, if Satan gets you to compromise on your convictions, God loses you, and you lose the hope of helping the people around you. If you stay strong, God gets you and everybody that you can impact. Yeah. So you've got the 12 apostles, the 70 apostles, apostles, the family of Jesus. You've got the women who followed Jesus and really operated as leaders in the first century movement. Isn't that awesome, sisters? Jesus is really the one that elevated women in society. He is truly the initiator of women's rights. You know, the guys, they don't believe the women. We find out maybe a little bit of chauvinism coming through the scriptures right there. They say what the, the women are saying is nonsense. You know, the Greek right here that's translated as nonsense means to be delirious in, in, in your speech as a sick or wounded person. It's kind of like if you go to the dentist and you get the laughing gas and you come out, you start saying all kinds of delirious things that make no sense. This is how the apostles, this is what they thought about what the women were saying that Jesus resurrected. They're like, you're delirious. Oh, the women are being emotional again. <laughs> You know, it's incredible, but here's where Peter separates himself. He gets up, runs to the tomb, finds it empty, and then goes away wondering to himself what has happened. You know, you can get to a place in your life where you're wondering why what has happened to you has happened. Amen. And you wonder why you're at where you're at. Yep. And you wonder why God has withheld things from you or allowed things to happen or, or made things happen that were not convenient or a part of your plan. Yep. And you walk away and, and, and you're, you're wondering, why am I here? Why did that happen to me? Why would God let that happen? You've got an option. We can either embrace the word of God and believe that we're being set up for an incredible miracle. Or we can cause ourselves to be down, depressed, and sad, even to the point of eventually falling away. When you get spiritual amnesia, you're in grave danger. That's why every morning 
We need to be in the word of God. Every morning we need to open our Bibles and hear God speak to us. And when we remember the word of God, instead of walking around wondering, perplexed, confused, and sad, we'll be filled with wonder, ready to do God's work. Point number two, the afternoon of burning hearts. Verse 13. It says, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. You know, it's incredible because it says two of them, well, two of who? Two of the 120. You know, it says that they were walking around. In chapter 16 of Mark, these two remain nameless, but Luke gives their name. It goes on in verse 17, or verse uh, 15, excuse, uh, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things he asked. So here are these two disciples are walking along. Jesus just shows up. They're kept from recognizing him. Maybe it's some supernatural kind of change in his looks or his appearance, or maybe they were just so overwhelmed with sorrow and grief and and had zero expectation to see Jesus that they simply couldn't recognize him. Wow. And then here, one of them is named. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. It goes on. It says about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came up and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. You see, they're there in the afternoon approaching evening. You know, it's incredible. In verse 21, it says, we had hoped, but they had lost their hope. Wow. They hoped that Jesus would remain alive and lead the kingdom back to glory, but they misunderstood the scriptures. It said, we had hope, therefore their face was downcast. There was a heart sickness, a hope unmet, an expectation unfulfilled. And then Jesus disciples them. They didn't even know who they were talking to. And he starts to lay out the truth about himself. Furthermore, it says it was the third day. You know, for the Jew, the third day is very important. After all, it was the third day in which Abraham brought his son and they arrived to Mount Moriah where he was to be sacrificed on the altar. On the third day, Joseph finally revealed himself to his brothers and said, I am your brother, Joseph. It was the third day, of course, that Jonah was vomited out of the whale. Amen. Something special can happen on the third day. And in verse 29, it says he goes in to stay with them. Now, this is very interesting. Most commentators believe that these were not two brothers, but rather a man and his wife. The man Cleopas is named, which means he was a part of the 120, most likely an apostle, one of the 70. Isn't that incredible? There's an equally fascinating scripture in John 19, verse 25. And it says that near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. You know, Cleopas is named in Luke chapter 24. His wife was there being numbered among the 120, meaning she too was a leader. Here in chapter 19, 25, when Jesus is dying on the cross, his mother was there, and it says his mother's sister married the wife of Clopas. That's a, a single change in the vow of this man's name. Luke 24, he's mentioned as Cleopas. 
John 19, he's mentioned as Clopas. Now, this is interesting because this happened all the time with names in the Jewish custom. We know that Silas was called not only Silas, but also Silvanus and, and Silvas. He had multiple names. Saul was later named Paul. Peter was later named, Simon was named Peter. Then he had another name, Cephas. So you say, well, who is this guy Clopas? The same guy in Luke 24, Cleopas. And it says that his wife was Mary's sister. Wow. He was Jesus's uncle. Wow. Now we know that Mary was an orphan, so it's not likely that she had any blood relatives close to her, but rather Cleopas was Joseph's brother. Wow. Is that not incredible? Wow. So not only was Cleopas an apostle, but his wife was a leader as well. Wow. You know, this Friday we've got the women's night. Wow. Why are we doing it? to get some awesome women to raise up in the kingdom of God. And you say, this is quite the pair. Wait, I mean, whoever this person was, whoever this couple was, this is a powerful married couple in the Lord. A part of Jesus' 120. Those are the type of people we need in God's church, amen? Powerful couples, a man and his wife taking a stand for the truth. And if they don't come, we'll make them when we get Jay and Tanya dating, amen? Go back to Luke 24. And in verse 30, it says, When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened. They recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. <laughs> they asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? You know, Jesus is in his resurrected body. He can do whatever he wants. Here he just vanishes. <laughs> And they said, we should, we should have known when he was talking to us, our hearts were on fire. Our hearts were burning. You know, that's what happens when someone preaches an awesome sermon. There you go, yeah. it, it, I mean, it, it burns your heart. On, Remember when you first came to church? You thought, who told the preacher? You look over at your friend like, I don't know. <laughs> you snitches get stitches, man. What did you do? You know what I mean? Like, it's the first time you've experienced that. You don't know what to do with it. Like, why is he preaching right at me? And he's talking directly to me, everything about my life. <laughs> then you, you become a disciple, you get used to it, man. <laughs> but I, I think we can get so used to it that our hearts can burn. We know exactly why, but we don't do anything about it. Oh, Today, I want to call us to make a change. Stop messing around with your relationship with God. Get serious. Get committed. If you're studying the Bible, it's time to give your life to Jesus and get baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You know, great preaching is defined by whether or not the hearts of the people in the audience are burning. Come on. They later transition into evening. Look at verse 33. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. You know, it's incredible. It says that Simon had seen the Lord Jesus. Now, none of the Gospels document that, but guess who does? 1 Corinthians 15. Amen. It says, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. I preach to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word, I preach to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than five 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, the 70, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. You know, Paul knew, and the early church knew that Peter had seen the Lord. He was the first man to see Jesus resurrected. He was rewarded because when everybody else thought that the sisters were crazy, he got up and dashed to the, to, to the tomb. You know, this is an important lesson for all of us, especially for those that are married. Amen? amen. When your wife tells you something, just listen. Amen. Yeah. Don't respond. Be like Peter, make a change, and then you'll be rewarded as well. Amen. At some point, he sees his risen Lord. Clopas confirms it and says he has risen. Go back to Luke 24 and we'll close it out with the evening of hope. Verse 36 says, while they were still talking about this, 
You know, they say it's going back and forth. Jesus resurrected. I don't think he did. No, yeah, he did. It's like doing a Bible study with somebody. You're like, you gotta, you gotta be baptized. I don't think I need to be. No, yeah, you need to be baptized. I mean, it says it right here in the word. You gotta be a disciple. And they're going back and forth. And then Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. I mean, that, that would be enough to get you going right there. That would freak you out. Just be honest. If you're sitting there and maybe we got a little bit of denominational seating right there. And you had an empty seat next to you, God forbid, and then Jesus occupies the seat next to you. He says, are you taking notes? <laughs> it says they were, verse 37, they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. You know, right here, again, there's a compression. The whole episode with doubting Thomas is pressed into one scripture. He says, look at my hands and my feet. Put your finger where the mark was. Can't you see that a ghost does not have flesh and blood? Can't you see here today that God has brought you to his kingdom? Yeah. That God has brought you to his house and that your life is very fragile and that your life is not promised and you need to make a decision today. Yeah. Can't you see Jesus resurrected? Why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your mind? You know, as, as Christians, we were fired up when we got converted. But as we go, can't you get a little troubled in your spirit? Get a little worried. We know Reuben and Jen had a hard week this week, amen? Say, so why, why are you troubled? Why are you troubled? What is troubling you today? What is it that is troubling you that you can't get over? Maybe somebody sinned against you in the past. Maybe it's a sin that you committed and haven't fully repented of. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's, it's worry about your children or worry about your parents or worry about what other people are going to think about you when you really get committed to God. Wow. Why are you troubled? Yeah. Are you troubled about maybe remaining single? Mm. Oh. After all, the promise is salvation and nothing more. Everything else is just a blessing. Yeah. Why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your mind? I'm hungry, get me some fish. I want to prove to you that I'm not a ghost. And ghosts don't eat. He takes it, eats it, and he says, that's pretty good. <laughs> and then goes on with his day. You know, we've got to repent from our worry. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You're not making disciples if you're anxious. Nobody that's wants right. to be around you if you're anxious. That's right. You can't do anything good for the Lord when you're worried. You got to repent and seek the kingdom first. That's right. yeah. God has called you to the standard of discipleship regardless of what's happening around you you need to focus your eyes on Jesus not to the left not to the right it doesn't matter what's going on around the world you know at the end of the day Jesus is not Republican and he's not Democrat Jesus is king every year for the rest of eternity amen there's no four-year cycle of voting it, at the end of the day, does not matter. Come on, bro. You got to get your life right with the Lord. Can I get an amen from the church? Amen. Can I get a witness from the church? Amen. Why did doubts rise in your mind? It goes on to verse 44. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead. And on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. You know, it says that they witnessed Jesus suffer, buried, and resurrected. But there's a prophecy inside of this. And he says that they will be witnesses that 
Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. This is the message of the gospel of Luke. This is Jesus's message that you will go into all nations. You will be his witnesses to all nations. This is Jesus's dream. Amen. Don't you want everybody to be saved? Yeah. I mean, for sure you want your family to be saved yeah. and everybody is somebody's family. Amen. Right. Yeah. The question is, where will the Lord send you? Have you stopped dreaming Jesus' dream? The cost is still the same. It's not increased or decreased from the time you got baptized. Maybe it's your faith that's changed. The dream is still alive and it's greater than ever. You know, God is just as fired up today as the day you got baptized. He's excited. He has a destiny planned out for you, a good plan with a hope and a future. He says this is a prophecy. Go to Matthew chapter 24. All right. Come on, bro. And we'll see this prophecy. Jesus doubles down on it. Matthew 24 in verse 9. He says, and you'll be handed over to the, be persecuted and put to death. You'll be hated by all nations because of me. And that time, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. You know, to hate somebody, you got to know them. Amen. Yeah. And it says that the apostles will be hated by all nations. And before the fall of Jerusalem, which is what Jesus is referring to here, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD by Titus that every nation would be evangelized, that everybody would hear about the word of God. You know, every Sunday, the Bible's preached in most churches, but we've got to take it a step further. We don't just present the Bible. Everybody does that. The Pope does that, sort of. Your preacher does that, kind of. It's preaching the truth about the Bible. Jesus confronted the Pharisees and says, you, know, you quote the scriptures verbatim. You know them like the back of your hand. I'm telling you the truth about the scripture. This scripture applies to you. That's what we do. That's what got Jesus killed. Not simply presenting the word, but presenting the truth about the word. Can I get an amen? amen. You know, it's incredible as we close out here in Luke 24. And it says in verse 50, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. You know, it's awesome. Jesus just blessing them right there. You know, that's, that's beautiful. He gives them this great benediction and just says, I mean, if Jesus comes to you and says, I bless you, I mean, like, thank you, you know. And it says, while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. You know, Jesus was the ultimate giver. Jesus always served. As he was dying on the cross, what did he do? Evangelize. As he was being taken up to heaven, what is he doing? Blessing the guys, giving to them, serving them, giving of himself. He's just blessing him. Verse 52, it says, then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. You know, Luke starts his gospel at the temple and ends his gospel at the temple, the very presence of God. So we see right here in the gospel to the nations at the very end, it's all about God. They're in the temple praising the Lord. Now, this is hinged on one issue. Did Jesus Christ raise from the dead? If he did, it separates Christianity from all other religions. It means that it is the truth and that to get to the Father, you've got to go through Jesus. Someone once wrote, yesterday is history. Tomorrow's a mystery. Today is a gift. And that's why they call it the present. You've been given a great gift. It's your life. Let your life, starting with today, be all about God. I love you very much, and to God be the glory.